Hello and welcome to the sixth lecture for the dark side of marketing, where today we're going to be talking about 5G. And today with us, we have a, a very special guest, Dr. Deborah Davis, who will be joining us and giving us her insights about uh, what is currently going on with 5G and all the kind of controversial topic of 5G with all the health issues that are sometimes related to it, but also the kind of uh, aspect of it that it will make the internet connections and everything much faster and by extension making our lives a bit easier in regards to that aspect. But at the same time, there are a lot of kind of issues that we have to take into consideration before using it. Now, when it comes to the, our guest speaker today, we have an individual who has a quite impressive resume. Uh, Dr. Deborah Davis uh, founded the Nonprofit Environmental Health Trust in 2007 in Teton County, Wyoming, to provide basic research and education about environmental health hazards and promote constructed policies locally, nationally, nationally and internationally. Uh, Dr. Davis started working on climate change as an environmental health issue decades ago, and as one of the scientists who was a lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and she was part of the team of scientists awarded the Nobel Peace Prize along with Honorable Al Gore. Uh, currently, she's a visiting professor in a range of different universities, from the uh, me medicine at the Hebrew University at Hadassah, Had Had if I pronounce that correctly. Sorry if I don't, Deborah. University of California, San Francisco, Berkeley, Georgetown, Harvard, London School of Hi uh, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and many more. And her most recent book, uh, it's, it's called Disconnect, the truth about cell phone radiation, what the industry is doing to hide it, and how to protect your family. And we will be more than delighted, Deborah, to provide a link to, kind of to where individuals can actually find the book and purchase it if they are interested in doing that. Um, so without any further ado, everyone, I will present to you Dr. Deborah Davies. Well, I want to thank you uh, for inviting us to speak today. I will do most of the talking in the beginning, but I also am pleased to introduce uh, Theodora Scarato, next slide. Um, who is our executive director and who has become really expert on the international uh, developments in this field, some of which are relevant to you directly, um, it, no matter that you're no longer part of the EU officially. Um, you can see here that we have a very distinguished group of advisors and scientists, including uh, Frank Clegg, who is the former president of Microsoft Canada and who is now the chair of our business advisory group. Uh, Paul Benny Shai, who is a lecturer in, in Israel at Ariel University, uh, Claudio Fernandez and Alvaro de Salas, not, not pictured here from Porto Alegre, Ronald Melnick and Anthony B. Miller, who is the most distinguished scientist I've had the honor of working with. And Ms. Ms. Scarato, who has a very impressive wealth of knowledge on the developments of 5G. In the next slide, <clears throat> what we're going to do here today briefly is explain that there's a, been a paradigm that's been developed. You are all part of that paradigm. It's how do you sell people on something that may be bad for them in the long run, but feels really good in the short run. And so I want to briefly go through the history of marketing of sugar, tobacco, asbestos, and radiation. And believe it or not, each of these things, the, the last three of which you know clearly can be dangerous, each of these things was marketed to public health as a benefit. And I'm gonna show you some amazing advertisements from the past. But the bulk of what we're gonna talk about today is 5G, cell phones and wireless technology. And it's important to understand the history of all of this. Originally, wireless radiation was restricted to the use of solely of the military and medical worlds. And it is and still is used to treat illnesses in some cases, to treat, to be used to promote bone growth in certain frequencies, uh, to in fact even target cancer cells in other frequencies, to enhance the uptake of chemotherapy. There are medical uses of radio frequency radiation that are almost 100 years old, since the discovery of radiation began itself. At the same time, the dangers of radiation became quickly evident. Um, the military uses are a bit of a black box. Every once in a while we hear about, for example, you may have heard about the diplomats from of the American, um, some of them worked frankly for the CIA, some of them worked directly for the State Department, and these people came back with brain damage after serving in Cuba and China, and, the, 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 uh, and, and there's concern 
that the cause of this damage is almost certainly to have been some kind of electromagnetic weapon. The, the question is what kind, and it's not even clear who did it. But the point is the history of this is that it was a really restricted chiefly to medical military uses in 1993. <clears throat> Then in 1996, a law was passed preventing anybody from objecting to the location of a cell tower in the United States. And you had a similar thing happen in England. And as a consequence of that law, there's a, there was a proliferation of antenna and it made it possible to have wireless telephone communication. Prior to that, it was very uh, restricted again to medical and military uses. Um, then they had to develop standards and this is where things went off the track. The standards were developed only to avoid heating for a six minute exposure. Now, ask yourselves, how many of you have ever just had exposure to your cell phone for six minutes? I think the answer will be none. And I'll take this moment now to let you know that what you have in your pocket, a two way microwave radio, and therefore please take your phones out of your pockets right now Preferably put them on airplane mode, stop playing that game and pay attention because what I'm about to tell you is going to change your ability to have children when and if you choose to do so. So these devices were tested on the 97th percentile of military recruits with a guy with a very big head. Okay, that means some, that means that 97% of people are smaller than the guy on whom they standardized the tests. They've never been assessed for their environmental or long-term public health impacts. But more importantly, and throughout this talk, I want you to keep in mind that war games has been the response of the advertising industry whenever there's been a report that something could be a problem. War games is the response, and I'm going to document that. More importantly, I want to thank you for being part of my experiment because everybody out there now who's using wireless technologies whether it's with your phone, which by the way, whether you talk or not, you're being exposed whenever that phone is on. You are all part of an experiment right now without any controls because the technologies have been designed to addict you and they have benefits. They have real benefits. They have improved our ability to respond to emergencies. So you can't, it, different from the other things I'm about to talk to you about, there's clearly a benefit of this technology and what we need to do and what we at Environmental Health Trust are calling for is reset our way of thinking about this technology so that it truly becomes a tool for us whether that, rather than we becoming a tool for it, which is I think what's been happening. Now on the next slide, I'll start with sugar. Believe it or not, sugar was once advertised as a healthy drink for babies because it would give them all that nice fat. Well, now we know that babies, and unfortunately some babies do drink soda uh, because they have uh, parents who no, don't know any better. Those babies are headed toward diabetes, uh, but it was once marketed uh, as something that children should have. Next. Now, having done that and having gone through a time when the world was in depression and people wanted their babies to be fat again, by the way, uh, because they had food deprivation, uh, you and in London, people were having were being forced to eat horse meat right after the war. It was a dreadful situation. And at the same time, the idea that women had to be thin was, of course, promoted in the fashion industry. And one way they did this was that um, in, in the 1940s, they actually put together a group of very tall, thin fashion models with long, elegant cigarette holders to walk down Fifth Avenue. They were featured in a Life magazine spread. And the, the message was, if you light up a Lucky, reach for a Lucky instead of a sweet. It will suppress your appetite. And those of you who unfortunately are addicted to tobacco, and I'm afraid there may be some of you, know that tobacco does suppress the appetite. It also gives you an increased risk of lung cancer, heart disease, stroke, and a number of other things that you should take very seriously. And there are medical things to do to help you avoid that addiction. But the addiction, next slide, was programmed and it was designed by taking people of great credibility. So here's an ad. Now, doesn't that look like a handsome young doctor? Smoke a fresh cigarette, fresh. Now these were the camel unfiltered cigarettes. And by the way, in surgical conventions in the United States in the 1940s and 50s were smoke filled. Uh, you can't believe that people smoked and especially surgeons 
unfortunately, some of them still do, some of the young ones even, because it's such a stressful thing to be a surgeon. But the point of this ad was that they took an image of a healthy, vibrant role model and said, "You, I'm going to smoke, you should smoke. Give your throat a vacation. Next slide. Now, marketing of products that were dangerous with information that was in fact known to be wrong at the time. This went on for things like pesticides. This DDT wallpaper was touted for a children's room. And we know that it outgassed, outgassed very dangerous agents into the air. And we know that workers exposed to DDT uh, died with greater liver disease, greater diabetes, and greater cancer. Next slide. When I'm I'm so old that I actually used to go downtown and there was a machine just like the one you see here. And I loved x-raying my feet because I was interested in science at an early age. Well, <clears throat> I, I ended up with some bone issues in my feet, most likely as a result of this. Um, and so far I've avoided the other possible effects. But the fact of the matter is radiation was being advertised as a benefit. The truth is radiation is a benefit. If you have, for example, a tumor in a bone and it's agonizingly painful, radiation can relieve the pain and sometimes remove the tumor. So there, again, there can be benefits of that ionizing radiation, but this was definitely not one of them. Next slide. This woman who I was privileged to know briefly in the end, uh, toward the last years of her life, she lived well into her nineties, was uh, uh, Alice Stewart, an MD. And in a fair world, she would have been considered a member of the British empire and, not, and uh, uh, given the accolades that she deserved. But in the fifties, she first did something very radical. She actually asked women whose children developed leukemia what exposures they'd had during pregnancy. And she determined that radiation of the pregnant abdomen, which was then standard procedure in, in, in England, was causing leukemia. And uh, in, in the beginning, she was vilified. At the end, she, uh, her, the validity of what she warned about was, was established. For those of you interested in this story and others related to everything I've just discussed, that's covered in my book, The Secret History of the War on Cancer. And as my sister reminds me, it's not a beach book, it's a big book, but there are wonderful chapters on this radiation risk, including the amazing work of Dr. Alice Stewart. Next, next slide. These gentlemen have their hands raised because they are swearing before God and country that they have no knowledge that nicotine is addictive. Well, we now know through the disclosures of the tobacco papers and inside reports from industry that, that they were lying. And in fact, not only do we know it, they were convicted that this these companies were convicted of fraud and racketeering by in a U.S. court by Judge Gladys Kessler, who who actually said that they had committed the same actions as mob bosses, and uh, it's a really interesting uh, development because they were convicted of racketeering because they knew there were dangers in their products and they were marketing. Now let's see what happens when it comes to the marketing of cell phones. And we'll see this video in a moment. Uh, watch your screen. So be straight with me. Is it true? It could be. No, well, there are a, a, you know, very no few cases. There was at all. an unfortunate really incident out in situation. Iowa. Look, gentlemen, practice these words in front of the mirror. Although we are constantly exploring the subject, currently, there is no direct evidence that links cell phone usage to brain cancer.